Let's investigate ladder operators and projectors for a single qubit Hilbert space. The kind of Hilbert space that we're dealing with in this video is two-dimensional. That means it describes a single qubit. A qubit is a quantum analog to the classical bit. So we can think of this as describing a physical system that consists of a ground state and an excited state. And those two states are the only accessible states in our description. We're going to use quantum mechanics to describe this kind of system. And this is very important in quantum information and in quantum computing. In this video, I'm going to be using Dirac's bra ket notation. I will also be using matrix representations of operators. And all matrix representations will be constructed using the Pauli Z eigenbasis. I've used this eigenbasis to construct operators in previous videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. In the first line over here, you can see br uh, this bra ket notation. And this is Dirac's bra ket notation. Anytime you see a combination where it's bra followed by ket, that is a bra ket. This denotes an inner product. Here we have an inner product and an inner product. Inner products can be evaluated to give a complex number. So this inner product is just a number. But if we switch the order around and we first have a ket and then a bra, that can be used to construct an operator. So this combination is an operator and this combination is an operator. But if we group them differently and we just consider these guys in the middle, that is an inner product. So that is just a complex number. These labels of 0 and 1 are just labels. They label the two states in the system. And we can think of this 0 state as corresponding to the ground state, and this 1 state corresponds to the excited state, or the first excited state. So that is what this notation actually means. And these two states are orthonormal. Normalization means that if we take the inner product of the state with itself, we're going to get 1. So if we look at this combination over here, the inner product of this state labeled by 1 with itself, that is going to evaluate to 1. So this is going to give a complex number, and that complex number is 1. It's actually a special case because it's a real number as well. And this over here is also going to evaluate to 1. So we can get rid of this, and we can get rid of this because this is just multiplication by 1. And if we do that, then we get these two combinations over here. And these two combinations of ket and bras, they are very special. They are projectors. And if we take the sum of these two projectors, we get the identity operator. And this capital I denotes the identity operator. The matrix representation of the identity operator is a 2 by 2 matrix. It is diagonal. It has 1s on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. So when we apply this matrix to any state, it will remain unchanged. That is why it is called the identity operator. It does not change anything that it acts on. So over here, we have all of the matrix representations corresponding to these Dirac notation combinations. We're dealing with bras and kets in this row, and in this row, we're dealing with the corresponding matrices. You can use whichever uh, notation you feel more comfortable with, and you can prove more complicated properties using these notations. You can either deal with bras and kets, or you can write these out as matrices, and you can multiply the matrices and add the matrices together. I want you to, to pay close attention to these guys over here. I have uh, written this condensed notation, which is a pictographic representation of what these operators actually do to states. This is a lowering operator, and this is a raising operator. You can see this line is at the bottom because it lowers, and this line is at the top because it raises. So we're going to see the action of these operators on states. And you can see that if you do this combination, you evaluate this combination, you will get the identity operator. What does this actually mean? What is this combination of operators? Well, it's actually called the anti-commutator. In a lot of the videos in the quantum mechanics playlist, we have seen commutators. That is, swapping the order of operators and seeing if it makes a difference. And a lot of the time, it does make a difference. 
a lot of operators are non-commutative in quantum mechanics. And commutativity is just a special case. And a lot of the properties of quantum mechanics actually come from that mathematical observation that operators don't necessarily commute with each other. But now, instead of considering commutators, we're considering anti-commutators. And anti-commutators are denoted by these curly brackets. Don't confuse this notation with Poisson brackets. Poisson brackets also use this kind of notation, but that's in a different context. That's in the context of classical mechanics. Over here, where we're taking the anti-commutator of operators, we're also going to use these curly brackets. And the anti-commutator has a plus sign over here. It does not have a minus sign. If we were taking the commutator, we would use square brackets, and we would have a minus sign over here. So this is a very important property between these ladder operators, between the lowering operator and the raising operator. If we take the anti-commutator of these two operators, we will get the identity operator. And instead of writing capital I, we could just write one over here. And one is understood to mean multiplying by one, or the action of the identity operator. So this is one of the defining characteristics of, of these ladder operators. And what we want to do is we want to consider what is this, what type of Hilbert space are we dealing with? We're only dealing with a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So these are not the ladder operators of the quantum harmonic oscillator. The quantum harmonic oscillator ladder operators are not going to satisfy this anti-commutation relation. They're going to satisfy commutation relations. And this actually is very similar to what happens when we consider fermions and bosons. And we will consider the differences between fermions and bosons in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. But I, I just want you to uh, make that connection between anti-commutators and commutators. Sometimes if we restrict the Hilbert space to only having two possible allowed values, we're going to have to switch to anti-commutators instead of using commutators. Now, if we add more states to the system, then we can actually recover the quantum harmonic oscillator. The quantum harmonic oscillator has many, many more states. In fact, it can have an infinite number of these discrete states. But we're just truncating that, and we're cutting that at just the first excited state. So we only have the ground state and the first excited state. So that is what I wanted to show you up over here. We have this condensed notation, and now what we can do is we can examine these operators and these operators. First, let's have a look at the projectors. In red over here, I've, I've shown what happens if you square these projectors. Now, this is one of the defining properties of what it means to be a projector. If you act with a projector on a state twice, it's not going to have uh, any more effects. So acting on the state once is the same as acting on the state twice. And what does that mathematically mean? That means squaring the operator is the same as the operator itself, where the operator is equal to its square. So let's reason to why uh, this is true. So if we take this combination over here, this is the, the projector that we have over here, and if we square that, what we're going to do is we can rewrite this in terms of these kets and bras. And if we write this as a ket bra followed by a ket bra, that's the same as squaring it. We're applying it twice. We can observe that there is an inner product that appears in the middle. And because of normalization, we can evaluate that to one, and we're left with what we started with. This is exactly the same as the thing that appears in the squared sign over here. So this is the same as its square. And we can also write this in terms of the Pauli matrices. This is one half the sum of the identity operator plus the Pauli Z operator. And we've seen this in previous videos of the quantum mechanics playlist. There's also another notation for these Pauli matrices. We can use sigma with subscripts. We can have sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. That is equivalent to writing i, x, y, z. So this is just another notation for the Pauli operators. And we're also including the identity operator. Now, let's have a look at this operator over here. This is another projector. And this projector, when we square it, we can use the same reasoning. We can write it twice. We can identify this inner product. We can evaluate that inner product as one, and then we get back to what we started with. This is before we squared it. It's exactly the same. And this over here has a very similar form. The only difference is there is a minus sign. So we have a minus sign over here. 
And both of these operators are projectors. This operator projects onto a subspace that is spanned by the ground state. And this operator projects onto a subspace that is spanned by the excited state. So you can think of this as counting how many of these excited states we have and counting how many of these ground states we have. In other applications, you can interpret this as a number operator, and this is a whole operator. So if you're familiar with how uh, band gaps in transistors form, this is one application of that. You can interpret these matrices as having the meaning of counting how many holes there are and how many particles they are in this material. So this is a very important matrix to understand, and this matrix as well. They are projectors. And the defining property of these projectors are that if you square them, it's the same as applying them once. So applying them twice is the same as applying once. And we also have analogous relationships in terms of these Pauli uh, matrices written over here. Here we have the Pauli X and the Pauli Y operator being used to construct the lowering operator and the raising operator. Now, we've seen these relationships over here. Why are we actually calling these lowering operators, raising operators, and projectors? What is the reason for, for giving them these names? Well, it's because of the action they have on general states. So if we consider a general state called Psi, this is a linear combination of the two basis states. We're dealing with a computational basis. So we have those states labeled by 0 and 1. And if we take a linear combination with coefficients alpha and beta, we also want to impose the normalization coefficient, uh, the normalization condition. And if we do that, we have this general state. So we have a coefficient for the ground state and a coefficient for the first excited state. What is the effect of the lowering operator on this general state? What does it actually do? Well, you can see that it takes this coefficient beta and it moves it down. So this coefficient that used to be the coefficient of the first excited state is now the coefficient of the ground state. And this alpha has disappeared. If we examine the columns of this matrix, we can see what happens to the basis states in this computational basis. Over here, we have zeros. So the ground state disappears. The ground state gets destroyed. But the excited state gets turned into the ground state. This is lowering. We're lowering from the excited state down to the ground state. That is what this actually means. And if we look at the raising operator, it is the opposite. This over here tells us that the ground state is being excited up to the first excited state. And we can see that over here. Alpha, this coefficient of the ground state, becomes the coefficient of the first excited state. And beta disappears. So you can't keep exciting on because we only have two accessible states. And that is why this beta disappears over here. And that, that also corresponds to these zeros. So this raising operator gets rid of the excited state. If you apply the raising operator again, it destroys the state. You cannot raise any further. And you also cannot lower any further than the ground state. So that's because we're stuck in this two-dimensional Hilbert space. So that is why these latter operators are called lowering operators and raising operators. They are very similar to what we encounter when we deal with the quantum harmonic oscillator. But there is a slight difference. They don't satisfy those commutation relations. Instead, they satisfy anti-commutation relations. And we're also limited to this Hilbert space, which is very restrictive. It's a, it's a much smaller Hilbert space than what we're used to with the quantum harmonic oscillator. Now, let's have a look at the action of these projectors. What happens if we look at these projectors? What do they do? to a general state. First, let's consider this projector onto the ground state subspace. What does it do? Well, it just gets rid of this beta. It gets rid of the coefficient of the excited state. So there is no more beta over here. And if you look at the columns, this ground state just stays in the ground state. So we're not doing anything to the ground state. We're just getting rid of the excited state. That explains this column of zeros. And something analogous occurs over here. Over here, we are getting rid of the ground state, and we're just leaving the excited state. So we're projecting onto a subspace. You can see over here, we just have beta, and over here, we just have alpha. And if we take the sum of this projection and this projection, we will get the same action as the identity operator. 
So the identity operator, when it acts on this general column vector over here, is not going to have any effect because it is the identity operator. It's the same as multiplying by one. And another very important property that we can see with these guys is that if you applied this matrix twice, it would be exactly the same as applying it once. That is the property that we have proved in this line and in this line over here. Applying it once is the same as applying it twice. That is the defining property of a projector. So we've seen why these guys are called projectors, and we've seen why these guys are called ladder operators. Let's have a look at another interesting property. We've seen what happens if we square the projectors, but what happens if we square the ladder operators? If we square the lowering operator, this is actually the same as taking one half of the anti-commutator with itself, because this would be lower lower plus lower lower, all over two, and that's the same as lower squared. You can see that this is the definition of an anti-commutator. And the anti-commutator, you can swap these guys around because of this plus sign. So this is what happens over here. We get zero, actually, because if we write this out in terms of the bras and the cats, we will have zero, one, and then zero, one. And because we have a one, zero combination over here, we can use that orthonormal property of the computational basis, and we can evaluate this to zero. So this becomes zero, and we have no terms left. So this is just zero. And this can also be interpreted in the matrix form over here. You can think of this as squaring this matrix. And if you square this matrix, you get a matrix that is just full of zeros. And we can represent that as zero. Because if you act with that kind of matrix on any state, it's just going to give you a state that is full of zeros. So the alphas and the betas, they're just going to disappear. You're going to have zeros over here. And that's exactly the same as multiplying by zero. And there's an analogous thing that occurs when we take the raising operator squared. If we square the raising operator, it's the same as taking the anti-commutator uh, with itself all divided by 2. And if we do this analogous representation in terms of Dirac notation, we'll have this combination over here. And this is actually the complex conjugate of what is over here. So conjugate symmetry is satisfied by the inner product, and we have the opposite order. But because this is a real number, in fact, it is zero, this is equal to what we have over here, which is also zero. So this evaluates the zero, and this evaluates the zero, and that just leaves zero over here. And if you square this matrix by itself, if you square that, that will also give you a matrix full of zeros. So what does that physically correspond to? If we apply this lowering operator twice, or if we apply this raising operator twice, we're just going to destroy the state. So that is just like what happens when you take a ground state and you try to lower it further, or if you take an excited state and you try to raise it further. We are restricted to this two-dimensional Hilbert space. So we can't raise this state any further, and we can't lower this state any further. So that is another interesting property. Anytime you see these mathematical properties, I want you to think about what does that actually correspond to physically? What kind of physical systems are we describing with this mathematics? We will be using these operators in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. We'll be talking more about Hilbert spaces that describe single qubits and multiple qubits. You can find those videos if you click over here.